In this video, we'll discuss omitted variables as a source of endogeneity. Let's start by writing down a linear regression model with two regressors. Suppose that we are interested in learning the effect of the variable x1. That makes x1 our variable of interest. And beta1 is our causal effect of interest. We don't really care about the variable x2 and its effect beta2. That makes x2 a control variable. Since we are not really interested in learning the effect of x2, it is a natural question to wonder why are we keeping this part of the model? Shouldn't we just be estimating a regression model with one instead of two regressors? Let's write down the model with one regressor. Actually, I cannot write down the regression model with one regressor like that. And why is that? Well, I have y here and y here, it's the same y. And then I'm saying it's equal to this and at the same time it's also equal to this so that will mean that these two expressions would have to be the same they would have to be identical however they are not unless this part here is zero is always zero which I don't want to assume my mistake here was that I used the same error term for both expressions. So I don't want to do that. So I'll use different colors instead. I have green error term here. And then I'll have a purple error term down here. Now these two expressions can be identical. For them to be identical, we just said purple u equal to beta 2 x 2 plus the green arrow term. Let's call the model with two regressors the uh, long model. And let's call the model with one regressor the short model. If we fit the long model by OLS, then we obtain the estimators green beta 1 hat and green beta 2 hat. Green beta 1 hat is an estimator of our causal effect of interest beta 1. But now beta 1 sh shows up also down here. So alternatively we may want to estimate beta 1 based on the short model. So fitting the short model by OLS gives us an estimator purple beta 1 hat of our causal effect of interest. Choosing between the long model and the short model is not trivial because green beta 1 hat and purple beta 1 hat will not be the same, so they don't give the same estimates. In my lecture notes, I'm calling the estimator from the short model alpha 1 hat so that it does not get confused with the estimator from the long model. However, then sometimes it confuses students that alpha one hat estimates beta one. So here I'm trying with different colors instead. That's a different approach to show that these two are different. Let's compare the estimators from the long and the short model. First, we look at a relationship that is true in all samples and doesn't require any assumptions about the underlying causal model. The slope coefficient from the short regression 
is equal to the slope coefficient from the long regression plus the sample covariance between x1 and x2 divided by the sample variance of x1 times green beta 2 hat. This identity gives two conditions for purple beta 1 hat and green beta 1 hat to be different. First, x1 and x2 have to be in sample correlated so that this here is non-zero. And second, we have to estimate a non-zero coefficient on the control. If these two conditions are met, then we'll see different estimates from these two estimators. What this identity doesn't tell us is how each of these estimators relates to the true causal effect beta 1. And this is what we want to eventually fill in here. But before we do that, let's build some intuition by looking at an economic example. For this example, the outcome variable is the exam score in an econometrics exam. The score is determined by different factors, including how much you study, let's call this study time, and your ability. Study time is our variable of interest. That is, we want to learn how does my exam score change if I study for, let's say, one extra hour. We can estimate a long model where we include both these variables as regressors. Or we can estimate a short model where we only include study time as a regressor. It is very difficult to measure ability, so in practice we actually may not have the data required to estimate the long model and the short model, maybe the only model that we can actually estimate given the data that we have. So in that case we may wonder, do we make any mistake in choosing this short model? To keep this example very simple, let's assume that study time and ability are the only two inputs that matter for exam score. So there isn't even a green arrow term U. And the purple arrow term is given by beta 2 times ability. Let's assume also that both studying more and having more ability increases your score. Let's look at student green guy. Let's measure green guy's study time on the x-axis and their ability on the y-axis. We know that the beta 1 hat estimator from our short model is given by the sample covariance between study time and our outcome variable exam score divided by the sample variance of study time. If we have a large sample, then by the law of large numbers, this is approximately equal to the same expression except that we substitute all the sample moments for population moments. 
and that is equivalent to having a population covariance instead of the sample covariance and a population variance instead of the sample variance. The sign of this will be equal to the sign of the population correlation between study time and exam scores. Now I want to demonstrate to you that this population correlation can be negative even though the causal effect of study time is positive. To estimate the short model, we need data on the regressive study time. So this is an observed variable. On the other hand, ability is probably unobserved, which is why we are estimating the short model rather than the long model, which uh, includes also ability as a regressor. This means, given the observed data, I know where to put green guy with respect to the x-axis. So if I observe green guy, I also observe what their study time is. For example, they are here if they studied a lot and here if they didn't study much. But I don't know where to put green guy with respect to the uh, y-axis. For a given observed study time, should I put them here or up here? I don't know. Let's add another person, red guy. Again, where we know where to put red guy in terms of study time, but not in terms of ability because that is unobserved. Given the observed study times, where do we expect green guy and red guy to be in ability space? Well, let's assume that high ability students choose to study less because they know that they will probably do well on the exam regardless of how much they study. And low ability students choose to study more. That means on average, the relationship between ability and study time is negative. Note that we can never observe or estimate this downward sloping line because we don't have data on ability, but this downward sloping line exists as a property of the economic environment. Now, if we have to place the average green guy in ability space, we'll probably place them on this line and the same for the average red guy. Compared to the average green guy, the average red guy would benefit from more study time but they would have less ability. If the ability effect outweighs the study time effect, then it is possible for the average red guy to perform worse than the average green guy on the exam, even though red guy studies more than green guy. In other words, it's possible that the correlation between study time and score is negative, even though the causal effect of study time is positive. Estimating the wrong sign of the causal effect is a very severe form of mismeasurement, but we can also have other forms of mismeasurement where we estimate the correct sign, but, mis but systematically mismeasure the magnitude of the causal effect. We will now um, look at a formula that allows us to very precisely characterize the mismeasurement from choosing the short model uh, under certain assumptions. The first assumption will be that our long model satisfies the exogeneity assumption for all S regression. That is the conditional expectation of green error term given regresses x1 and x2 is zero. This implies that green beta hat one and green beta hat two are unbiased and consistent estimators of the structural effects beta one and beta two. In particular, green beta one hat estimates our causal effect of interest without systematic mismeasurement. Systematic mismeasurement in the short model can only happen if the exogeneity assumption for the short model is not satisfied. 
So when we interpret our formula for mismeasurement, the case that we have implicitly in mind is the one where the exogeneity assumption for the short model, so the conditional expectation of purple u given x1 equals zero, is not satisfied. Or in other words, the case where we have an endogeneity problem in the short model. This formula worked under no assumption whatsoever. It's true for all samples. Now we need some assumptions. So we're going to assume that the exogeneity assumption for the law model is satisfied. And that we have a large sample. Implicitly, we also assume that the model here correctly describes the functional form and that the random sampling assumption is satisfied. But um, like the more critical assumptions here are these two, so I'm gonna focus on those. Under these assumptions, the estimator from the short model is approximately equal, and this approximation holds for large samples. So this is the same kind of approximation we used when we talked about consistency. So beta one hat is approximately equal to the true causal effect beta one plus the popul population covariance between x1 and x2 divided by the population variance of x1 times beta 2. This new formula looks very similar to this formula. And indeed, I show in my lecture note that, it ca uh, that you can derive this formula from this formula. However, in terms of interpretation, they are very, very different. This formula doesn't relate purple hat one to the causal effects, but this formula does. In the second formula, the true causal effects beta one and beta two show up. Unlike beta one hat and beta two hat here, they do not depend on an estimation strategy. The true causal effects are properties of the economic environment and not of your estimation approach. This is why I have written them in black and not in green or purple. Similarly, this quantity is a sample quantity, so it will depend on the, the particular data set that we're looking at. And before looking at the data set, we cannot predict exactly what the sign or magnitude of this will be. In contrast, this here is a population quantity and we may be able to use economic theory to pin down its sign and its magnitude. Our new formula says that the estimator from the Sharp model estimates the true causal effect plus this thing. So the sign and magnitude of this thing tells us by how much our estimation is off. So this gives us our mismeasurement. In econometrics, a fancy word for mismeasurement is bias. And this particular bias here occurred because we are choosing the short model rather than the long model. Or in other words, we are om omitting this control variable. And this is why this kind of bias is called the omitted variable bias. So how should we think about this kind of large sample approximation? Well, even if we don't have an energy problem, our estimated causal effect will not be exactly equal to the true causal effect, and that's because of estimation error. Now, as we increase the sample size, our estimation error goes down 
um, or in other words, the variance of our estimator decreases. In a very, very large sample, there's essentially no estimation error. A bias is a kind of mismeasurement that persists even as we get rid of estimation error. Let's apply this formula to our study time example. x1 is study time and x2 is ability. This ratio here gives the slope of this gray line. We argued that the slope may be negative. In that case, here we have something negative. Also, we assumed that the true causal effects of the two inputs are positive. We assumed positive and positive. Multiplying in negative with a positive quantity gives a negative quantity. So the emitted variable bias will be negative. Let's put all of that into a graph. So here we have the real line. And let's say that this here is zero. Our causal effect beta one is positive. So let's put it here. Now to arrive at the value that we are measuring, we have to add the omitted variable bias or OV bias as it's commonly abbreviated. Since that is a negative quantity, we are moving in the direction of this arrow and we may be arriving, for example, here. What I've done here, I have illustrated the case that I've already discussed previously, where a very large negative OV bias flips the sign of the causal effect. So we're estimating the wrong sign of the causal effect. If the magnitude of the bias was smaller, it may take us only, for example, up to this point where we are estimating the correct sign, but underestimating the magnitude of the causal effect. It is tempting to think that if we have a negative OV bias, then we are underestimating the true effect. And if we have a positive OB bias, we are overestimating the true effect. Um, that is actually not in line with how we intuitively use the terms overestimate and underestimate. Let me illustrate this with an example. Suppose that we are interested in investigating the effect of smoking on your health. And that is probably a negative effect. So we would have to put it here. Now, if we have positive OV bias, this may take us from this true negative effect up to, let's say, here. So we may still be estimating a negative effect, but a negative effect that is smaller in magnitude than the true causal effect. In that case, we would intuitively say we're estimating the correct sign, but we are underestimating how severe smoking is. So we have a positive OV bias, but our in intuitive interpretation would be that we are underestimating the true causal effect. Let's summarize very briefly what we talked about in this video. So we talked about a situation where we start out with a model that is well specified. It satisfies the appropriate all as action 80 assumption, but then we omit an important control variable, maybe because that control variable is not observed so that we don't have data on it. We showed that this can lead to OV bias. And this is related to endogeneity because obviously if the short model satisfied a appropriate uh, an exogeneity assumption, then it would estimate the correct causal effect. 
So the reason behind OV bias is the endogeneity in the Sharp model. So you have learned that the endogeneity assumption may not be appropriate if you omit important control variables. What are important control variables? Well, important control variables are variables that are correlated with a variable of interest and that have their own effect on the outcome variable.